Somewhere in the southwestern United States is a prison that we'll just call Asher State Penitentiary. That's not its real name. I'm not allowed to disclose that. But it will do for now. If you've been following me up to this point, you'll know that Ashurst is a little more than just your regular prison. Sure, up on the surface you'll find the sorts of folks who belong in a maximum security prison. Serial killers, drug lords, and whatnot. But down in the basement, where I work, that's where you'll find a whole new breed of fucked up. Monsters, demons, fey, sirens. They're all real and the worst of the worst are kept beneath Ashurst. My job is to interview some of the more talkative ones. You'd think it would be easy, but trust me, I don't think there's a more dangerous job out there. After my late night run-in with our former inmate, Malaki the Vampire, I got a week off to relax after the whole ordeal. I just wish I could say I was actually able to relax. If you've never had a vampire fake a seizure just so they could create enough of a scene to slip out of their restraints and finally taste some fresh blood, it's not an experience I'd recommend. Malaki's little stunt had left three of our staff dead, one staring down a new life as a vampire and me with some brand new nightmares. Considering how close Malaki had gotten to tearing out my throat, I consider myself lucky that the warden stepped in and killed him when she did. If she'd been just a few seconds later, I might not be typing this right now. I think it goes without saying that I'd been thinking about Malaki a lot during my time off. Not just because he'd come very close to killing me, but I couldn't help but notice that there were a few things weird about how everything had gone down. I'd only been dealing with him that night because the warden had found evidence to suggest he'd been making friends with another inmate. Considering that for the safety of the staff, we don't let certain prisoners out of their cells, that was a little concerning. Malaki was the sort of high-risk monster who was supposed to stay locked up at all times. He wasn't something that could be rehabilitated. The only reason he'd been kept alive was for research purposes. So he really shouldn't have been socializing with any other prisoners. And yet, someone had sent him some pretty detailed instructions on how to slip out of cuffs. In a pretty obscure dead language, no less. Salinan isn't exactly a language that people spend a lot of time thinking about. It's native to an indigenous people from California. Some records I'd pulled placed Malaki in the region for a significant chunk of the 1,700 seconds he'd supposedly been present during the Spanish occupation of the area. It probably wasn't a stretch to assume he'd picked up a few new languages while he was preying on the locals. As for who else could have possibly known it, well that was a little bit harder to figure out. I could have spent months going through the history of every ancient inmate at the prison, trying to track their movements over the past few centuries and I probably would have come up with nothing. Thankfully, whoever had sent that note to Malaki had left one very big clue to their identity. Out of the hundreds of creatures we kept locked down in Ashurst, I only knew one who had a reputation for slipping her cuffs. Kayla Del Rio. She's a class 2 siren I've been dealing with for the past little while. I wouldn't outright call her a model prisoner, but we have much worse than her locked away in Ashurst. As monsters go, she's not that much of a pain in the ass. Although if she was the one who told Malaki how to get out of his cuffs, well... I've been wrong about inmates before. As soon as I got back from my leave, I was itching to have a little chat with Kayla about Malaki. I wasn't sure just how forthcoming she'd be with information. Everything I had to suggest she even knew Malaki existed was circumstantial at best. I could have just as easily gone and blamed any other inmate. But my gut told me that it was Kayla. I wasn't scheduled to speak with her until close to the end of the day, though and I was busy enough that I didn't have time to bump her up on my list. My boss, Dr. Hendricks, was probably trying to go easy on me that day. When I got my schedule for the week, I couldn't help but notice I had all the more well-behaved inmates booked first. The ones who were least likely to try and murder me. I can't pretend I wasn't a little relieved. After watching an emaciated vampire slaughter three people, I was happy that my first interview of the day was with a werewolf who was up for release. 
we mostly just talked about the strides he'd made with his anger management therapy. Maybe I just believe in people too much, but I was good and convinced that he wouldn't turn into a giant wolf just to threaten his neighbor during an argument again. I consider that progress. Then I had another siren, who'd thankfully only been busted for reckless driving. She was only at Ashurst because it was the only prison that would take into her account her particular needs for survival in captivity. Hey, I didn't say that every inmate we had was the worst of the worst. Some are just idiots who can't be sent to a normal prison. Honestly, those are my favorites. It was during my lunch that my pager beeped with an urgent notification from Bob Hitch. Bob was the head of the research division and any message from him was not something that could wait. New tenant to be processed. Sector 4. Lunch break had just been cut short. I just about had time to wolf down the leftover chicken I'd brought from last night before getting up. Maybe it was sloppy but I didn't really have time to clean up. I closed the Tupperware I'd brought and stuffed it back into my bag, then wiped off my fork and knife with a napkin so they'd be moderately clean before hurriedly stuffing them into my pocket as I got up to meet Bob. Like I said, any message from him was something that couldn't wait. A new tenant meant that something new had just been brought in. I figured I was the only guy available at the moment to do an incoming interview while they got the cell ready. Bob was waiting for me outside the interview room when I got there. He had a bit of a sheepish smile on his face, and that alone told me that whatever was waiting for me in that room was going to be something bad. Good to see you back, Barry, he said. How are you holding up? Shaken but not stirred, I replied. What have you got for me? A class 3 demon. He goes by Ferris. He got booked in Denver, haunting the bar scene. No idea how many victims, but you can never tell with these. Okay, so this was bad, bad. Demons are complicated things. Unlike most fae, they aren't born the way they are. Dryads, sirens, most werewolves and a lot of other creatures can't help themselves. They're born into what they are. That said, unlike other entities who are born human like ghouls, vampires and mediums, they don't become what they are through any particular event either. Becoming a demon is a very slow process, and it starts with death. There are some old texts that discuss what happens to the souls of the deceased. Considering that I've never died before, I don't know just how accurate they are, but supposedly when you die, you either go into a peaceful afterlife that's usually called the gloom, or you're discarded into a not-so-peaceful afterlife called the abyss. By all accounts, the abyss is not a nice place to be. If the giant centipede god of destruction looming over it, snacking on the souls of the damned isn't disturbing enough, there's what becomes of the souls who wander that hellscape. Supposedly, something about the abyss changes a person's soul. It makes them break down and become more feral, less human. I suppose in order to get into the abyss in the first place, a person already needs to be shitty. But whatever it is about that place, it makes it all worse. The end result is a demon. A hungry, cruel husk of what used to be a person who was already bad enough to end up in hell and if one of them finds a way to slip out of the abyss, well that can be a real problem. The weaker demons aren't that much different than a ghoul or some other shambling monster, dangerous and terrifying to look at, sure, but nothing to write home about. It's the more powerful demons that you need to watch out for. The ones who know how to look human. They're the ones who move about in plain sight, looking for fresh meat to devour. Then when they zero in on their target, they pull them into a darkness that conceals them from everyone who could be watching, and they feed. They can do it on a busy street and nobody would notice. They wouldn't hear the screams or the crunch of bone. They wouldn't know anything was awry until after the demon had long since slipped away, not even leaving a body behind to mourn. Of all the horrible things that exist in this world, I don't think any of them scare me more than demons. So what are you hoping to get out of him? I asked Bob. I know the trepidation in my voice was clear and I could see a flash of sympathy in his eyes. The names of victims would be nice, but I'm not going to hold out any hope. He said, get a feel for him, I guess. Keep him talking. Maybe he'll slip up and give us something. 
He didn't sound confident, but who was I to argue? I caught myself taking a deep breath to steel myself for what was going to be waiting for me on the other side of the door. I knew it was probably going to look and sound human. It wouldn't drop its facade for me just because it got caught. It was probably going to try and convince me to let it out or something. I'd dealt with these things before. I knew how it went. It never got any easier, though. You good? Bob asked. Yeah, I'm good. Let's go have a chat with him. Bob nodded before scanning his keycard at the door and opening it for me. Together we stepped into the observation room. A two-way mirror looked out on an empty interview room lit by pale fluorescent lights. On one side of it was a bulletproof glass cell that took up the space where a chair for the entity I was interviewing would be. There was space on either side for an armed guard to be stationed. The setup was routine, save for one little detail. There was nobody in the cell and no guards at their stations. I felt my heart skip a beat as I drew closer to the two-way mirror, looking out at the interview room with wide eyes. Where the hell is he? Oh no. Bob's voice was shaking. Looking back over at him, I saw that the color had almost drained from his face. I'd only been at Ashurst for a few months, but that was long enough to know that Bob is not a man who scares easily. You can't scare easily if you're working this job. No, no, no. He shook his head before running for a nearby wall where the security alarm was. Ashurst is littered with big red security buttons just in case of any incidents. They were standard in every interview room, but I'd never seen what happened when one was pressed before. Bob pulled back the plastic casing that covered the alarm and pounded his fist down on it. A deafening klaxon alarm began to sound. Bob pulled a radio from his belt and ushered me out of the room, grabbing me by the hand as he pulled me down the hall, back towards the lunchroom. Parker, this is Hitch. We've got a code red, inmate out of containment, a class 3 demon. I'm initiating lockdown now and demanding all non-security personnel fall back to checkpoint Alpha. A staticky voice replied over the radio, one that I recognized as belonging to Warden Parker, understood, Hitch, sending in security. Even through the static, I could hear the grated concern in Parker's voice. Bob and I sprinted down the hall as a mechanized voice spoke over the intercom. Code red, lockdown engaged. All non-security personnel rally at checkpoint Alpha. I could see other members of the research team leaving their offices and moving at a run down the hall in the same direction we were going. Some of them looked calm, others didn't. I suppose it was easy to tell who'd seen this before and who hadn't. Code red, lockdown engaged. All non-security personnel rally at checkpoint Alpha. I'd been briefed on the security protocols in the event of a code red. Every member of the staff had. We needed to know them inside and out. In the event of an inmate getting out of containment, all non-security personnel were to regroup in a designated safe room. It was the only room in the Ashurst complex that could hold everyone inside. Security would split into several teams. One would accompany the staff, the rest would sweep the prison. I knew that power to the elevator had been shut down and the elevator shaft itself had been sealed the moment that Bob had hit the security alarm. We'd all be stuck down there until security dealt with the threat. As we moved down the hall, I could have sworn I saw one woman moving against the crowd. Some idiot who thought something they'd forgotten was more important than their safety. I paused for a moment to yell out to them, Come on. We've got a security breach. The woman looked back at me and as she did, I felt my blood run cold for a moment. I only got a quick look at her face, but I could have sworn I was looking at Kayla. Before I could say anything else, I felt Bob grabbing me by the shoulder. Come on, he snapped before yanking me away towards the safe room. The woman I'd seen turned and continued down the hall in the other direction. Quickly disappearing amongst the others who were rushing for safety, I was ushered into the safe room along with the rest of the staff. I could see Dr. Hendricks there already with most of my co-workers. 
Warden Parker was speaking with a member of the security team and Bob left me to run up and join her. I glanced over at the door as security glanced into the hall to confirm that everyone was safely inside before they sealed the door. Do you have any idea how it got out? I could hear the warden asking over the anxious whispers of the rest of the staff. No. It was gone when Barry and I went inside. Bob said, my guess is that it's somewhere around Sector 4, disguised as a member of security. Then I need the names of the people who were on its security detail. We need this contained right now. Put me in touch with the outside security. I want to know what's happening out there second by second. The warden ushered Bob into a small side room and left the door open. I pushed through the crowd to get closer to them. Maybe I was being presumptuous, but I wanted to know what was going on as badly as they did. Get back with the rest of the staff, Barry, the warden said without even looking up to acknowledge me. She was hunched over a small desktop computer with a full map of the facility. I could see numerous dots spread out amongst the different sectors. Some were green and moving, others were purple and stationary. Considering that the purple dots seemed to be where the cells were, I figured they belonged to the prisoners. With all due respect, ma'am, Bob involved me here. I want to know what's going on and if I can help. That was an order, Barry. Let him stay. Bob said, God knows, we could probably use a hand right now. The warden just huffed and smoothed down her fiery red hair. She didn't make another word of protest. I took that as acceptance of my presence. The blue dots moved through the corridors of the prison and I heard static over the radio on the warden's belt. This is Johnson, second squad. Sector one looks clear, ma'am. Acknowledged, Johnson. Keep your eyes peeled. We're still on code red. You see anything you don't like, shoot to kill. Bob folded his arms, his expression remaining stern and stoic. The warden's radio crackled again. Klein, 5th squad. Sector 6 is clear. Appleby, 3rd squad. We're all good in Sector 2. Acknowledged. Stay frosty, boys. Ferris disappeared in Sector 4. Bob said, who's in there? Looks like it's 6th squad. The warden replied, give them a minute. Let them check through. She trailed off, her brow furrowing as she stared at the screen. It took me a moment to figure out why. Every other cluster of green dots had six, six guards patrolling the area. But the one in Sector 4 only looked to have four. The warden picked up her radio again. Sixth squad, status report. There was a crackle of static over the radio, but nothing else. Sixth squad, come in. This is boys, sixth squad. Came a voice over the radio, having technical issues. Sector seems clear, but we're continuing our sweep. The warden didn't seem convinced. Boys, how many are in your squad right now? Six, ma'am. I'm reading four transponders. Technical issues, ma'am. Acknowledged, boys. How's your team on matches? We use lighters, ma'am, and those are better, until they go wrong. I saw a bit of relief pass over the warden's face. She sank down a little bit, then shook her head. I understood the passphrase she was using. It was something else that every member of the staff needed to learn. Passphrases to prevent anything from assuming the shape of and passing itself off as a staff member. It wasn't something any inmate, especially a brand new one, would know. They're fine, she said. We'll keep a close eye on them. Our demon friend probably got spooked by the lockdown and tried to hide. So do we just wait them out? I asked. We've got the supplies down here to last us six months if needed and if necessary, we have an evac plan. We'll be fine, Bob assured me. Just get comfortable, Barry. We're going to be here for a while. He patted me on the shoulder and I nodded before heading back to rejoin the rest of the staff. I could feel a sinking feeling in my stomach as I left the warden and Bob to their work. But that was more about the concept of potentially being stuck down there for a while, as opposed to anything else. Maybe it was childish, but the idea of just waiting out this bug hunt seemed more exhausting than anything else. I spotted Dr. Hendricks and one of our co-workers, Christina sitting on a bed and talking quietly amongst each other, and I briefly considered joining them before deciding against it. 
Some other members of the staff had gotten into the food supply already and were passing out dried banana chips and bottled water. I figured that eating something couldn't possibly make me feel any worse so I queued up in line to get some for myself. Most of the rest of the staff had splintered off into their own little groups and talked quietly amongst each other. A member of security was in a storeroom just beneath us, checking the inventory for bedrolls and water. In the distance, I could hear the faint clacks and alarm outside in the hallway, and the reality of the situation that we were in hit me hard. I'd never actually thought I'd see the day I'd end up in this situation. Sure, I'd been briefed on the possibility of it back when I'd started. Bob had shown me the procedures to follow and everything. But he'd also told me that he'd only needed to activate Code Red and move everyone into the safe room once before, during a drill. Maybe it was a little arrogant of me to think that nothing would ever happen, and it was juvenile to be upset now that it was happening, and I was facing the possibility of being stuck in a cell of my own for the foreseeable future, but I digress. Regardless of how the situation made me feel, this was the reality I currently had to face. Once I got my banana chips and water, I looked over towards Dr. Hendricks. Christina was gone. I didn't see her anywhere nearby, but I didn't dwell too much on it either. I moved to sit down beside Hendrix, sighing and rubbing my temples as I did. What a fucking day, huh? I asked. He laughed humorlessly. You're telling me, he replied, any word on when they're gonna find this thing? Nope, it's probably still in Sector 4, but who knows? Maybe it hauled ass straight for the elevator and is already topside. That's what I'd do, Hendrix said. I offered him a banana chip. He hesitated for a moment before taking one. Any idea what got out? A demon, a new inmate. I said I was going with Bob to process it when we found the cell empty. My guess is it figured out how to dupe the guards, ate them and then disguised itself as one. It'll make it a hell of a lot harder to find if that's the case, that's for sure. Even harder if it's smart enough to hide. Hendrix nodded thoughtfully before staring out at the rest of the staff. Where would it hide anyways? How many cameras are in here? It'd be hard to find a place that isn't on camera. I said, maybe the bathrooms. That's about it. Again, he nodded and I went quiet. Why was Hendrix of all people asking about how many cameras were in here? The question seemed off. I surveyed the others in the safe room around us, subconsciously looking for Christina. Did they say when they were going to get us out? Hendrix asked, it can't be long. A few days, at most. We've got enough supplies to last us six months down here. I replied, looking back over at him. Speaking of which, I could use a smoke. Have you got a match? Sorry, all out. Hendrix replied sheepishly. He smiled at me, but I couldn't help but think it looked just a little nervous. His eyes met mine, and as they did, I could see a quiet realization in them. With just one look, we both understood everything we needed to understand about each other. He knew that I wasn't really asking for a light. I knew that he wasn't really Dr. Jason Hendricks. Suddenly, the space around me seemed so much darker. I looked around again. The staff around us was still moving, but they seemed dimmer. Almost far away, so far they wouldn't see what would happen to me. Hendrick's face began to change. His features seemed to fade away into something darker and less detailed. A blank, black slate that looked charred and infected. With a panicked cry, I leapt away, falling off the bench and onto the floor as Hendrix slowly stood up. He didn't say a word to me. We were past the point of conversation. What he was doing was no doubt in self-defense. I knew what he was, and if he didn't kill me, I'd make sure that somebody killed him. The demon, Ferris, his body began to split open vertically from head to torso. I could see a reddish-pink maw opening up in him, like a horrific Venus flytrap of flesh. Rows upon rows of teeth awaited me in that gnashing mouth, and I knew he'd swallow me whole in an instant. No, was the only thing I could think to say, no. I tried to scramble back, but Ferris loomed over me, shambling closer and closer. His rancid breath exuded over me. The smell was that of death. Christine's death, Hendrick's death, my death. He overtook me, his arms seizing me by the shoulders as he forced my head towards his mouth. Oh God. 
Oh dear God, this was it. Desperate, I could feel the weight of my lunch utensils in my pocket. I pulled the fork I'd carelessly jammed into my pocket earlier out. It wasn't much. Just a simple, stainless steel fork, but it would have to do. Without thinking, I thrust it into the pinkish flesh of Ferris' mouth. The fork tore through, drawing rotten black blood and earning an angry snarl from Ferris as he recoiled. His grip on me slipped just long enough for me to wiggle out of his grasp. I could see his body pulsating in pain as he ripped the fork from his mouth. He huffed in frustration before collapsing down to all fours and loping after me. But I'd bought myself just enough time to get up and run. I sprinted towards one of the dim figures nearby. Another staff member, somebody whose name I didn't remember off the top of my head, but he was my only salvation. I slammed into him, tackling him to the ground and praying it would be enough to break whatever illusion Ferris cast to keep the others from seeing me as he fed. As I hit him, the world suddenly seemed less dim. Ferris was almost on top of me, his hands grabbing at my body as he began to force me into his maw. That was it. I'd shot my shot. I'd made my one attempt at escape. Now I could only hope it would be enough. I didn't need to wait long for either death or salvation. Before Ferris could sink his teeth into me, he was violently pulled back. I could see the white coats of other members of the research team grabbing at him, pulling him away from me. It took almost eight people to hold him back, and his jaws gnashed violently all the while. But when they slammed shut, they didn't slam shut on me. Ferris snarled and struggled. He writhed violently, shaking his captors off of him, but he did so in plain sight, in full view of everyone. I watched as he threw some of the research team who was holding him back off of him and let out an enraged screech. Then came the gunshots. His body jerked as it was hit, but he didn't fall. Looking back, I could see that just about every member of security was up and had their guns drawn and aimed at him. The people who'd pulled Ferris off of me quickly abandoned him, giving him a wide berth as security lit him up. Bullet after bullet tore through his body, leaving their marks but hardly slowing him down. From the corner of my eye, I could see that Warden Parker had rushed to their side, her own gun drawn and firing on Ferris. He was tough, all demons are, but they aren't invincible. Ferris seemed to fall backward, riddled with bullets. His limbs flailed violently as he struggled to hold on to his life. Maybe if he'd been anything other than a monster, I might have felt bad for him. But as security continued to unload into him while he squirmed on the ground, I felt nothing but relief. His struggles quickly ceased. His breathing was heavy and sporadic. I'm not sure just how many bullets he'd taken. 20, 30, 40. Far more than any living thing should be able to survive. And yet still he clung to life, struggling to continue to live up until he exhaled his last breath and dribbled more black blood onto the growing pool on the floor. I could feel Bob's hand on my shoulder, reaching down to help me up and on trembling legs I stood. You good? He asked, real concern in his voice. I nodded, before looking down at Ferris' corpse. He, he was disguised as Dr. Hendricks. I said quietly, I, I think he ate Christine too, I, my words failed me. I was still trying to process all of this and yet doing it felt impossible. I suddenly felt exhausted, as if I wanted another week to sleep. Hell, after this, maybe I'd get it too. Demons don't leave behind corpses. They eat everything. The bones, the clothes, the hair, all of it. The fact that we never found the bodies of Dr. Hendricks or Christina almost certainly confirmed their fate. I later learned that a review of the security camera footage from that day revealed that Ferris had ambushed Dr. Hendricks in his office right before Bob had tripped the alarm. Even in the safe room, we would have caught it eventually. Ferris had been a rat in a trap the moment he'd been brought to Ashurst. But if I hadn't been able to save myself from him, who knows how many others he would have picked off before anyone figured out what he was. The warden offered me a few more days off. I appreciated the offer, but I declined. 
Part of me wants the time to myself, but I don't think I can take it in good faith right now. Now that the incident with Ferris is over, I can't help but think about what I thought I saw in the hallway while Bob was ushering me into the safe room. I'm sure that I saw Kayla. I'm sure that she was out of her cell. I know that sounds impossible. I know that if she'd been out, it would have shown up on the warden's monitor. But I know what I saw. I can't prove it yet, but something tells me that Kayla had something to do with Ferris getting out. I'm already certain she had something to do with Malaki's attack the other week. So is that really so much of a stretch? I don't think it is. Thanks for tuning into our scary story today. Don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to our channel for more spooky tales like this one. Until next time, stay safe and keep your lights on at night.